the Vegas Take Sharp and Shapiro. So glad you could join us on a Wednesday. And oh yeah, you know what that means. It's Wednesday, and that means it is time to get in the ring with our friend Michael Avenatti, who joins us right now live, and a lot to get to with Michael. How's it going, my friend? What's up, Michael? It's going going well, gents. It seems like every Wednesday we've got plenty to talk about. We do. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we do, and I say unfortunately because of uh, all the uh, horrific mass shootings that have taken place in the last week. But before I get to that, let's talk about one of your favorite uh, pals that I'm sure you guys go out for beers every night, Tucker Carlson. Uh, you know, he goes on Fox News last night, and he says something that is just beyond atrocious, incorrect, and in my opinion, unacceptable. And in some ways, you know, you look at fire Tucker Carlson on Twitter, it's trending. So I want to play this cut, and then I want you to respond to it. This is Tucker Carlson last night talking about white supremacy on Fox News. But the whole thing is a lie. If you were to assemble a list, a hierarchy of concerns or problems this country faces, where would white supremacy be on the list? Right up there with Russia, probably. It's actually not a real problem in America. The combined membership of every white supremacist organization in this country would be able to fit inside a college football stadium? I mean, seriously. This is a country where the average person is getting poorer, where the suicide rate is spiking. White supremacy, that's the problem. This is a hoax. Just like the Russia hoax. It's a conspiracy theory used to divide the country and keep a hold on power. That's exactly what's going on. Michael, your response to that? Well, it's absolutely absurd. It's atrocious, but unfortunately, in Tucker Carlson losing his job. I mean, look, guys, let's be frank. Um, at this point in time, Fox News is nothing but a propaganda channel. Uh, it is designed to further the agenda of the right. It's designed to further the agenda of Donald Trump in the White House. Tucker Carlson, I know for a fact, is you know one of Trump's right-hand guys relating to messaging and the like, Fox News is not going to fire Tucker Carlson, no matter what he does or says at this point. Uh, the truth has nothing to do with what people like Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity, uh, quote, report, close quote, on Fox News. It, it, they're, they're propaganda. They're part of the pro propaganda machine. Now, as it relates to the substance of what he said, you know, it's, it's outrageous. It's absolutely false. Anyone who claims that there is not a significantly greater problem with white supremacy today than there was three years ago is either living under a rock or is absolutely lying. Of course, there's a bigger problem. Uh, and we need to acknowledge it and we need to address it. And, you know, it wasn't too long ago that I was on your show and I mentioned repeatedly that we are sitting on a powder keg and it is growing incrementally better or bigger, I should say, by the day. And here we are, you know, a week or two later, uh, following these two mass shootings, at least one of which uh, was driven by hatred of Latinos and others, uh, bolstered by the words of the president. And this is going to get a hell of a lot worse before it gets better unless we do something. What do you what do you make of Donald Trump visiting El Paso today? There are a lot of people in that area that did not want Donald Trump to be there. And it seemed to me, and you correct me if you think I'm wrong, that in Donald Trump's remarks, he actually made himself out to be the victim when he went out there. What do you make of that? Do you think the president should have just stayed away? At this point, there could be no denying that this guy is one of the, the largest, biggest narcissists in public life um, today, if not the largest. I mean, he makes everything about himself. He brings everything back to what he's done or uh, how people are attacking him or how he's been victimized. There's no question about that. Now, look, I happen to believe that if the president of the United States wants to travel to the United States city, he's entitled to do that. He's the president of the United States. If he wants to go to El Paso, he can go to El Paso. If he wants to go to Dayton uh, and land in Toledo because he thinks Toledo's Dayton and Dayton is Toledo, <laughs> you know, so, so, so be it. He can, go, he can go anywhere he wants to go. But I don't believe that he, he's handled this at all in a presidential manner. Uh, he handles every one of these events just like he's handled everything else over the last three years. It's like a campaign stop. You know, this guy is, is constantly campaigning. Uh, he hasn't governed a day uh, in his life. He hasn't governed a single day 
over the last three years while he's been president of the United States. And that's one of the fundamental problems that he has. So in the El Paso shooting, there was a semi-automatic weapon used. Do you think that since the Constitution was written basically in the, in, in the late 1700s when, when the Second Amendment came to fruition and technology has changed significantly since then? Back, back then, there was, there was a weapon, there was a musket or something along those lines that could kill one person with one shot. Now you have a weapon that can shoot off 200 rounds in 30 seconds and take out 100 people. Do you believe that the Second Amendment should be revisited for impossible alteration? Well, I, I wish it would be, but you're not going to be able to amend the Constitution. You're not going to be able to amend the Second Amendment. I mean, just I'm a realist. I'm a pragmatic guy. It's not going to happen. You're not going to have the votes. It's going to be virtually impossible, if not impossible, to do. So you're going to have to go addressing this problem in a different way. Let me, let me say this. There is no reason why anyone in the United States needs to have an assault weapon who is not in the military or in law enforcement. There is no reason why anyone has to be able to go out and buy a hundred round magazine or drum in order to go shooting. There's just no, there's no need for it. And in fact, if you talk to a lot of people in law enforcement, they are supportive of the idea that these weapons should not be out on the street because it makes their job increasingly difficult and incredibly dangerous. This is a question of reasonableness. I have no problem with people having reasonable firearms relating to hunting. I don't think you're going to be able to eliminate handguns, um, but there's got to be reasonable measures. You know, I was thinking about this, guys, and, and this is absolutely true. In 1988 or 89, when I was a junior or senior in high school, my one of my main papers that I had to write an essay was on the NRA's campaign against gun control is deceptive. That was the title of the paper. Perhaps my mother, who's still alive, God bless her, has it, has it somewhere. That was 1988 or 89. And here we are in 2019. The problem has only grown worse. It has not gotten better. And it's all about money and the influence of the NRA and spineless politicians who send thoughts and prayers as opposed to doing what the hell they need to do. Yeah, could, could not agree more. If you're just joining us, we're joined by Michael Avenatti. Michael, what did you make of Joaquin Castro's tweet, tweeting out, sad to see so many San Antonians as 2019 maximum donors to Donald Trump. He named a few of those donors. He goes on to say their contributions are fueling a campaign of hate that labels Hispanic immigrants as invaders. You know, my, my opinion on this, I don't think he said anything wrong. It's public knowledge, number one. And number two, it's not like he's going out and saying every Trump supporter is a racist. He didn't say that. What, what do you make of that tweet? I, I loved it. I thought it was great. I thought, I thought he stole a page from the playbook of the right and the Republicans. And I think that's why they're so upset uh, about it is because they're not used to people uh, on the left or left of center playing hardball like that. Look, none of this is confidential. It's all available in FEC reports and the like. He's calling these people out. Now, you know, the people on the right, a number of them are so up in arms about this because they don't like the tactics that they use used against them, number one. And number two, they're afraid that it might be effective. And then, of course, you have the ridiculous, asinine comments that Biff made this morning on Fox and Friends. <laughs> yeah, we'll get I, to that. Which I, yeah, which we'll... I thought was just... It was just absolutely basic. Let's let's get to that, Michael, because we have that audio ready. Uh, let's talk about your best friend, Biff. Uh, we're trying to get you guys, by the way, to get in the ring on Christmas Eve here in Las Vegas. Don't know if that's going to happen, but we're going to try to get that to happen. But uh, we'll get back to that later. So uh, as, as you said, Biff, also known as Donald Trump Jr., is on Fox and Friends this morning comparing a list of San Antonio Trump donors published by uh, the congressman to a kill list by the Dayton shooter. Have a listen to this audio, and then we'll respond to it after. That list sort of screams like the Dayton, Ohio shooters list, right? When, when a radical left-wing politician who's polling at about 0% does this for either attention or a call to action, it's pretty scary. Well, I mean, that was, that was the same list. thing this, that the Dayton, Ohio shooter this did. This is a list. And people should be out. fed up of this nonsense. This all right, Michael, your response to that. Well, you know, first of all, anyone who is not on the right, according to Biff and his father, 
uh, is a radical left-wing politician, first of all. I mean, th th these guys have never met anybody that is left and center that's not a radical left-wing politician. And then secondly, this assertion is ridiculous. It's ignorant, uh, and it shows how out of touch this guy is and how, again, he loves to uh, spew propaganda that has no basis in reality. Comparing those two lists, I, I, you know, I'm almost at a loss for words to even describe it. There's no comparison between those two lists, a kill list versus a list of donors that's publicly available by way of the Federal Election Commission online on any number of websites. There's absolutely no comparison. Yeah, I totally I totally agree with that. It, it, it's This guy had a kill list, he had an assault list, and he had a rape list. They're, they're not even in the same category. I do have an issue with what Castro did because I believe that it could really affect businesses in, in a negative way, and it, it was it was done in, in malice. Michael, do you think that we're at to the point where parents buy their children Kevlar or bulletproof backpacks or book bags, and there should be a protocol like a fire drill where these children use these backpacks to protect themselves in case of a shooter? Well, I hope we're not there, but I'm afraid that we are getting there um, at, at, a, at a rapid pace. You know, I can remember the days when I grew up, we used to drill for nuclear attacks because it was the height of the Cold War. Uh, and now, you know, a lot of these kids, a lot of these schools are drilling for, uh, for mass shootings uh, and school lockdowns. Uh, and, you know, that, that is pathetic uh, in my view. It's pathetic that we have so many spineless politicians that are not willing to stand up to the NRA and uh, instill some very basic gun control measures to prevent these shootings. Now, a lot of people say, well, you're not going to pre prevent all the shootings, and this law or this rule would not have prevented this shooting, for instance, or that shooting. What if we just prevented one a year for the next five or ten years? You know, what, what is that, 10, 200 lives? Yeah, roughly. 300 lives, 100 lives? I mean, if that was your brother or mother or sister or somebody you loved or one of your kids, you'd be all for it. Sure. If, if their lives were spared. I mean, we've got to start somewhere, gentlemen. You know, you look at you look at the rates across the world relating to mass shootings. There is no other explanation as to why we have so many more mass shootings other than it's guns. It just is guns. It is. And and, you know, I don't know if you noticed this, but I have advocated um, you know, on social media and otherwise, I'll, I'll tell you one way that we could really make a dent in this very, very quickly. And a lot of people don't know this. Gun manufacturers and ammunition manufacturers have a special liability reduction law here in the United States. The federal government passed a law that basically holds that people cannot sue gun manufacturers or ammunition manufacturers for liability issues relating to their products, except under extreme, very, very difficult circumstances to overcome. Now, to all of my friends out there on the right, the capitalists, the business owners that do not have these liability protections, how is that fair to you? Mm. How is that right? Why do you have to worry about conducting your business and selling your products in such a way where you don't get sued, where a jury doesn't stamp your ticket, for damages, but the gun manufacturers and the ammunition manufacturers, they have this special law because of the special interest that gave them this protection. We should remove that protection. We should allow them to be sued just like any other industry. And guess what, gentlemen? If they're not doing anything wrong, then they won't have a problem defending themselves. And if they are doing a lot of things wrong, if they're manufacturing products that they know can kill people in an unreasonable manner, then they're going to pay the price. And I'll tell you, if we, um, I would predict if we removed that liability provision, that protection, this situation would be cleaned up within 36 or 42 months. I agree. It goes, yeah. the, it goes to the heart of the issue. What matters most to these manufacturers is money. It's not lives. It's all about money. Absolutely. And, and you make a good point. There's a lot of major business owners on the right that may have establishments that are being shot up with these weapons. Yeah, yeah, no and, question. And they have to deal with their own lawsuits, no. I'm sure, along well, the way. Know, but, but, not, but not only that, look, look, casinos in Las Vegas can get sued if they do something, uh, if they do something that is not appropriate or not reasonable under the circumstances. Boeing 
an aircraft manufacturer here in the United States, if they manufacture a product that's unreasonably dangerous and it goes down and kills 230 people, guess what? They've got to pay the piper. They've got to be held responsible for, for the condition of that aircraft and what they manufacture and put out into the marketplace. Yeah. Uh, Ford Motor Company, the list goes on and on. Why are we protecting the gun manufacturers and the ammunition manufacturers well, simple in the United answer. States? That's S- not free market. Simple answer, uh, in my opinion. I'm sure you would agree. The NRA is backing many of these campaigns, and, and many of these politicians are cowards, and they're not going to do anything well, about it, and they're going to side with the NRA. And, and you know, is is it totally unreasonable to just let these semi-automatic weapons be sold and, and t- to, the, to the military? I mean, the contracts are still multi-billion dollar contracts. Yeah. Well, it w- they would lose money. I think that's well, the problem. I mean, they yeah. would, but yeah. in, in Michael made a very good point. When you hunt with sure. with an AK-47, you're kind of cheating. No, no, no question. I, the I, animal has no chance, and you can't yeah. even eat it after. I, I want to uh, – I, I agree. I want to switch to – let's try to talk about some positives out at, of at this ordeal and these families that have lost loved ones. It's a horrible situation. Let's take a few, Repu- uh, a few Democrats – that I think have stepped up to the plate and, and two that are running for president. I know you support Joe Biden. I do think, Michael, that Joe Biden has spoken out on this and he's done a very good job. I, I'm going to tell you, somebody that I haven't talked a lot about is Beto O'Rourke, but i got to tell you something. I think he showed a lot of leadership uh, when it comes to this issue a, a, and this shooting in El Paso. He's been out there in the open. He has not held back. I give Beto O'Rourke a lot of credit. Well, I give him a lot of credit as well for stepping up under the circumstances. Um, but, you know, one moment does not a campaign make, gentlemen. And, uh, it, you know, I, I've been very outspoken. I wrote an, uh, an op-ed a number of months ago uh, where I threw cold water on this whole Beto mania, and I said that he is not the guy to go up against Donald Trump, and he's not the guy to go up against Donald Trump. I mean, in many ways, he's a cheerleader. He doesn't like confrontation. Uh, the list goes on and on. It's a, it's a lengthy piece. People should read it. Now, that doesn't mean he hasn't done a great job over the last few days, and he hasn't been outspoken on this issue. But look, he's not a fighter. He's not the fighter that we need to match up against Donald Trump. I think he should actually go back to Texas and run in the Senate race. I think he would win that race, uh, which would be incredibly helpful to the party as well as the country. He's got a lot of years ahead where he can run for the presidency. He can face somebody that he's better suited to face off with. Um, but let's not kid ourselves. I mean, let's not ignore, ignore the last 18 months uh, because the last four or five mm-hmm. days have been our work. But again, with that said, kudos to him. Uh, and I've publicly stated that he deserves our appreciation uh, and a lot of kudos for the way that he's handled this. Look- now, I do think I do think that Joe Biden, uh, you know, I've, I've been a proponent of Joe Biden uh, for a long time. I think he's the Democrats' best chance to beat Donald Trump, look, is he as progressive as we want? No. Uh, is he going to lead the revolution that many people want? No. Is he as perfect as perhaps a lot of people on the left would like? No. But he gives the Democrats the very best chance of beating Donald Trump in those key electoral states that I've talked so much about. And I thought he showed a lot of leadership the last four or five days, and he too has found some fire in the belly. Do you think that Beto O'Rourke should go by his real name, Robert Francis? Uh, look, I think Beto O'Rourke can go by any name he wants to go by. I mean, you know, if he wants to change his name to Jose, Jose Rodriguez, he can change his name to Jose Rodriguez. I mean, you know, look, I mean, you know, we, we can all go by whatever name we want to go by, and, and voters will ultimately make a decision as to whether that's, you know, authentic, um, authentic or not. I mean, my problems with Beto O'Rourke uh, are that, you know, he's he's a glorified cheerleader. He doesn't like confrontation. He doesn't believe that we should really, I mean, this is very out of character for him um, the last four or five days. I mean, yeah. this is a guy, this is a guy who went after me six, seven, eight months ago and said that I did not represent the Democratic Party in the way that I approached Donald Trump, that I was too confrontational, that I was, I, I was too argumentative yeah. with Donald Trump. That's and ridiculous. That he was worried about the... It was worried about the level of discourse. Well, guess what? In the last four or five days, evidently, he's become a hell of a lot more like Michael Avenatti and a hell of a lot yeah. less like Beto O'Rourke. And you know what? A lot of people are praising him. We're not the only two the last four or five days, so we should take a page from your playbook. We're going to take some calls coming up here in just a few minutes with Michael Avenatti joining us at 702 702- 257-5396. But before we take a break, Michael, uh, let's go back to your best buddy, Biff, Donald Trump Jr. 
This is the son of the president of the United States. Michael Moore decides to go on Twitter. I'm a big fan of Michael Moore. I, I really like his movies. Forget about his politics. Uh, I think he's a compassionate guy. I like his movies. So he goes on Twitter. Uh, this was like several hours ago. And he says, that's it. I just canceled my Soul Cycle membership. So all the problems going on in the world right now, Michael, and Donald Trump Jr. decides to take to Twitter, retweets the Michael Moore tweet that he canceled his Soul Cycle membership, and Donald Trump Jr. tweets lots of laughs. I'm sure you did, Mike, like a few decades ago, making fun of Michael Moore's weight. When I can tell you right now, if his father got on a scale with Michael Moore, I think that would be a toss-up of who wins that one. First, what do you what do you make of that? Everything going on in the world and the president's son going on Twitter making fun of Michael Moore's weight. You know, he, look, this guy is a he's a punk. I mean, I've said it before. I'm going to say it again. He was born with a silver spoon in his mouth and a gold toilet under his ass. Um, it, he has no his level of maturity is is virtually non-existent. Uh, he, he doesn't know how to read the room. And, you know, of all the people that should be lecturing someone or mocking someone because of their weight, Don Jr. is, you know, is not at the top of the list of guys that should be doing that. I mean, he's not exactly the uh, he's not exactly the picture of good health and uh, fitness at this point. All right, uh, Michael, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to take some phone calls. On the line with us, of course, is Michael Avenatti. The number to call if you want to ask Michael a question, and boy, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that have a wide variety of questions in regards to the mass shootings, in regards to Donald Trump's rhetoric. Here's your chance to ask Michael Avenatti anything you'd like. 702-257-5396. I will start by saying this, though. He is not going to be talking about any of the issues he is facing in the courtroom. So if you have any of those questions, you can save it for another day. He's not going to answer those questions because he can't. So any other t questions, though, he will... Uh, answer 702-257-5396. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with your calls and Michael Avenatti right after this. You're listening to the Vegas Take right here on the all-new 101.5 FM, 720 AM, K-Dawn.